Hey friends, you're listening to Halfway There, episode number 189, Tom Hale and Living an Authentic Life, and especially important for today's day and age. I hope you listen. Well, hey friends, welcome to Halfway There. This is the show where we have honest conversations with ordinary Christians about today's Christian experience. I'm your host, Eric Nevins. Thanks so much for being here. This uh, Today, our guest, i um, really excited to bring this conversation to you. He's got an interesting message and has had an interesting life. Can't wait to share it. Uh, he is an author and uh, he's, a, he's a PhD student and he's lived around the world. Uh, our guest is Tom Hale. Tom, welcome to Halfway There. Hi, Eric. It's good to be here. I'm excited to have you and, and make the connection. Uh, start off and just tell us a little bit about who you are and where God has you right now. Right now, I'm in Hong Kong, and I'm here because my wife is from Hong Kong, and uh, we are here. She's the primary caregiver for her mother at this time in life. Okay. Well, you've, uh, so that's interesting for sure to have you in, in Hong Kong, which is kind of, a um, you know, been in the news a little bit. Um, what, so tell us a little bit, like, what are you doing for work there? Is there any kind of, you have, you have a ministry or you're doing school? I'm full-time working on my PhD from oh. here. What are you studying? The residential part of it. So I can finish the rest of it from pretty much anywhere in the world. Nice. What are you studying? I'm studying intercultural studies uh, at Fuller Seminary, and um, in particular, I am trying to understand some of the things that make, um, in my observation, evangelicals not get so well with a lot of people who who disagree with us fundamentally at, mm-hmm. at certain levels. Right. Yes. Okay. Well, that's kind of interesting. We'll have to hear some more about that because <laughs> that's one of the things that comes up, I think, uh, a lot, particularly in the spiritual journey, which is what we talk about here. Uh, some Sometimes there's beliefs you have to let go, right? You have to you have to go, oh, that's not true. That's not actually what the Bible says or not the way I was taught it or whatever. And And then you have to figure out how to be kind and still relate with the people who still believe what you what you believed. Yeah. There are those who say that it isn't about beliefs, but about action. That's what I want to study and get into more, uh, because there are examples of people who have very strong beliefs, and yet their actions to individuals show love. Uh, mm. It's it's an interesting. Oh yeah. All right. Well, I want to hear more of your story, and let's let's get into your story. So. Uh, I don't even know because we've met just briefly, but so where, where did you grow up? Well, I grew up in Nepal. Yeah. Uh, my parents were missionary doctors there and we moved there when I was four. And we had a period of language study in the capital city. And then we, they moved out. We moved out to a village where uh, they worked in the hospital. And uh, when I was six, I went away to school which I understood as being choice because I had gone to kindergarten when my parents were in the language study phase. And so I, I liked that. I enjoyed the school there. There was an American international school. And so I understood that it was my choice to go back there when, when I was six or six and a half. And, wow. and it was time to start first grade. Wow. Okay. But of course, were you really making a choice though? Well, <laughs> sort of. The point is, I never felt like I was sent to gotcha. public school. You didn't feel like you were being sent away or anything. No, I was. I was the, the first time that we went. I was excited to go. I was. I was into it, and and I never lost that. Actually, I was always happy to go back, even though I, nine years of schooling in in Kathmandu, and. There were some years that were better than others, say. Yeah. But, uh, but I never was. No, mom, I don't want to go back. Gotcha. Um, was that so? T- describe Nepal for us a little bit. What was your experience? Obviously, when you were there, 
it was kind of just, that's how life is. Right. But what was that like? Cause most of us, most of my audience is in the United States. So we've never been to Nepal. Maybe we've seen pictures or a documentary or something, but we have no idea. So describe that for us and what that was like. It was an awesome place to grow up. Uh, we lived on the side and you could see the mountains to the north and the mountains to the west, the Himalayas. Uh, it was a hillside that my brother were able to explore and there was a sort of jungle up the hillside, not sort of with tigers and stuff, although I guess there were leopards in it. Oh, wow. But uh, it was really nice. And, and I suppose being white and growing up in Nepal in the 70s, the, the benefits of the British Empire extended to us, I think. Even though Nepal was never a colony, they, if I had been from a different background altogether, Chinese growing up in Nepal or something, I don't know what it would have been like. Mm. Uh, but as a white person growing up in Nepal, it was very nice. There were times when people would call me names uh, they they had a name for white people uh, called Quire, and they would call me that. I never was partly maybe become white. I don't know. These, these are that have come to me much, much later, yeah. only in the last five years or so. But uh, I never was worried by this name calling. Maybe somehow in my mind I knew that Uncle Sam is behind me somewhere. Yeah. Um, That's interesting. I don't know. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Well, that's, that's kind of a, I know as a kid, like I said, you don't really notice those things, but, um, yeah, it sounds like it's a beautiful place to be and maybe, um, be, being a white guy, you, you had some privilege that you weren't aware of probably. Um, and, and the people, particularly the people in the village, but also in Kathmandu, uh, were, are, are, well, I don't know. Are, I haven't been there in almost 20 years. Yeah. They, uh, they were really, warm, friendly people, you know, the vast majority. Mm. And so the, the, the colors were a minority and, uh, and it was a really pleasant experience being there. Yeah. Very cool. So uh, I'm guessing if your parents were missionary doctors that you heard the gospel early, what was, what was that like? Did you have, I assume you had kind of a, uh, you know, yeah. some sort of religious life as a family. Yeah, well, when I when I went off to school, the, my mom accompanied me, and the first night before she left, I don't know, she suggested that I ask Jesus into my heart, and I did. I'm not sure that I really understood what I was doing. I think she may have been thinking about, oh, no, he's, he's not with us anymore. We, we better do something. Uh, but uh, over the years, I think I was 12 when a Sunday school teacher explained that every other religion is humans trying to reach up to God, but in, in Christianity, God reaches down in Jesus to us. And that made a lot of sense to me Yeah, as, as a distinction, because we lived in Nepal, which is a Hindu majority country. And, and so the Hinduism is all around you very visibly in Nepal. And so... How did that affect you? Um, well, it's interesting. A lot of Americans, when they go to a place like Nepal, they find it very dark uh, spiritually. Uh, I never had that experience per se. There was there was a, a festival where there were dancers in really horrifying masks, and I remember as a kid being terrified at those events. Uh, but other than that, no, in Kathmandu, there's, a, there's, Kathmandu is one of the m most temple filled cities in the world. Yeah. And so one of the, one of the goddesses there is Kali and the statue of Kali is, you know, got skulls and she's trampling mm. on a body and multiple arms. And, it, wow. but that, that didn't disturb me as a kid growing up. And I feel like sometimes when we say that there's something that's spiritually dark, what we're reflecting is modernity versus pre-modernity. 
And as, as moderns, we look at something that's pre-modern and we say it's dark. But we yeah. don't see darkness in our own modernity. Right. Uh, and actually... <laughs> There's plenty of it, right? <laughs> yes. I mean, you don't have to look any much further than all the violence that we witness on television for, exactly. you know, for darkness for sure. Wow. And then we pretend to stand in judgment. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, that is interesting. Okay. I looked up a picture of the goddess Kali. That's yeah, that's definitely interesting. And uh, okay. That's, that is, that is different. Okay, but so did this, cause here, here's the image that came to me as I was listening to you it rem- sounds very much to me like what first century Christians might have experienced a culture where maybe the worship was different, but where there were temples around a very religious culture that, um, you know, has a lot of worship, but it's not necessarily the God of the Bible. And it's not at all the God of the Bible, right? That, um, and I was curious if that shaped you at all in ways that you could identify and go, Oh yeah, that, taught me this or there's a story maybe where you where you kind of realized how god was different that's an interesting question i haven't thought of that before uh, i the church in nepal is an interesting story mm. because it wasn't actually planted by missionaries at the, there were no, basically no missionaries in Nepal until 1951 or so. Wow. Um, after 1951, before 1951, for 150 or so, there was a family that ruled the country that kept everyone out. Uh, but Nepalis had come out into India and become Christians there. And mm. at about the same time as the foreigners were allowed in, uh, Nepalis began to come back and start churches in Nepal. And so um, the the church in Nepal was, has always been Nepali-led, and whatever missionaries were there were there on the side. And uh, for a long time there was very little growth, uh, but then during the time that I was there, toward the end of the time, the, the, the church began to grow very rapidly. And, uh, and it's, I don't know what the numbers are now, but uh, yeah. significant. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Okay. Um, so, you, so you were in school and do, doing, doing those kind of things. How did you um, – you, you said you were 12 or so when, when a teacher started explaining to you more about Christ and kind of how that works. Mm-hmm. How, how did you grow as a, as a believer? Was, were there somebody who invested in you or were there books or a study that you did that, that really helped you see the Lord differently? Well, as a kid, that was Sunday school and I read the Bible. I memorized the Bible when I was a kid. Um, and of course my parents were an influence, although were less of a direct influence, partly because I wasn't, there with them for most of the year. Yeah. Uh, and then when the, the school that I was in, in in Nepal ended at ninth grade at that time. And so from 10th to 12th grade, I was at a, a Christian boarding school in Northern India. And that was a really wonderful experience. That was a highlight of my childhood. And what, what, there we had. What made it so great? Uh, well, it. The, when I first arrived, I was I actually came in the middle of tenth grade, so I was really a new kid. And um, in the very first day, there was some guy who, who, recognized that and uh, initiated friendship and just you know, hey, you're the new guy. We're glad to have you, kind of thing, and. Uh, um, and he said, don't worry, you'll find your niche. And it was true. I did. Um, there were, and then most of the kids did have a niche, various <laughs> different groups. It was a fairly small school. We had 60 kids in my class. Um, 
so there, there were different groups in the school. It was about one quarter missionary kids and 50% probably Indian students. And then the other 25% were from all over the world and various different um, professions of their parents. And, and so that was, I enjoyed that setting, the, the international nature. And again, as a, as an American, it was an American system school. So, so the, there's, there's a word that's throwing around now called white normativity. And I, again, I benefited from that because yeah. I was the norm. And, right. um, and I, I don't think that, that says that those who were not the norm didn't enjoy the school. I, all of my Indian friends from the school seem to have positive experiences. Um, so it's not, <clears throat> not necessarily a racist thing, but um, yeah, I don't know why I keep coming at that, except that this is something that I have been realizing over the past few years. And um, so it, it's something that I reflect back into my, my past experiences. Yeah, totally. Well, I think it is interesting. You know, I mean, man, I grew up in Iowa, so I was one of the mm-hmm. most white states that we have, right? Mm-hmm. Um, although we did have some diversity, but mm-hmm. so I, I kind of, I get that, you know, I think also looking back, you know, we used to like to go, oh, well, racism's not as big a problem now. That just was stupid. It wasn't true, right? It was it just wasn't mm-hmm. true. It was us just wanting to not have to think about it. And that's okay, but you can look at back at... We, we thought we solved a lot yeah. in the 60s. We thought we solved everything in the 60s, the 50s and 60s. Right. And things did change, uh, but it didn't end the issue. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But there were still systemic things that we couldn't see. There, indeed. And that, you know, so I'm with you. You just in the last few years been able as I get, grow, I hopefully get some maturity. I can go, Oh yeah, I can see that now. I can see what, you know, what was, why you would still be upset about that. Yes. Okay. So I think it's okay to, to have those kind of experiences. I'm, I'm really interested in, in that. Um, it is an interesting topic as well in, in the idea of missions, right? Like there's, mm-hmm. there, there is a, a thing, um, where does it mean, you know, does bringing someone to Christ mean bringing them to your culture? Not, not necessarily, right? That's a that's a big question. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, so you're at the school. Um, I'm curious. I mean, do you have a story or two maybe about how you began to develop your own sense of who God is and your own sense of your relationship with God? Well, again, being in this multicultural environment where followers of well, Christians were about half of the school, and uh, there was a Friday morning Bible study in particular that the, the host family were teachers at the school, and they would make pancakes for us every Friday morning. So that, that got us up out of bed early. And up. Yeah. The school is on a hill. It's at about uh, 7,000 feet uh, in the Himalayas, and the dorms are 500 feet below the the school buildings wow. and the, the faculty members who's the teachers whose home we had the Friday morning Bible study and they were up at the school level. So we had to walk uphill 15 minutes or so in order to get there, um, which we had to do to get to school. And you had to get up early to get, get to Friday morning Bible study. So the breakfast was, it was a draw there. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty, um, that, that helps. Yeah. But that that was a place where I really grew uh, in my faith, and and again sharing with with classmates, um, a number of people in our class, uh, three in particular that I think of, you know, professed faith in Christ. They've all moved away from that, which is interesting. Mm. But uh, but sharing your faith with someone who doesn't follow it, that is very deepening and and growing for yourself. And so that was the experience that I had in sharing with these friends who didn't follow my faith. Uh, I actually, I actually had a Muslim roommate at, uh, at Woodstock and that was by our mutual choice. He was my best friend. Um, and we had lots of conversations about religion in particular, the Trinity bothered him. And Mm. uh, I never gave him an answer that was, that satisfied him. 
we, we, we saw each other toward the end of college, uh, or no, after college, and he concluded that the Trinity was nothing but a poor excuse for polytheism. And that was after wow. you know, he had studied it more while he was in college. And so, and then at that particular instance, we were both sort of trying to convert the other, and we realized that that wasn't going to happen. And sadly, we ended up going different ways at that point and, and not not continuing the friendship. I mean, we weren't in the same place, so yeah. it would have been a long-distance friendship. But but sadly, that that's what happened. Uh, yeah. And back then, that would have been harder to do, right? Like, you'd, That's true. It would, would have been letters. And, yeah, yeah. Email. <laughs> it's different today, you know. That's one of the things I love about Facebook, because I can be connected to people from all different eras of my life, But whereas uh, that would not have been the, the case back then, so... Uh, so that's okay. It's understandable, but yeah, interesting. I think that is kind of an interesting objection from someone who doesn't come from a, a Christian or a culture that has a Christian ethic, right. Or a Christian idea mm -hmm. of, of the world. That, that is kind of interesting. But where'd you go after, after that? I came back to the States for college and I was in the navigators in college. Okay. That was a very significant growing experience for my faith. Yeah. How, how did that shape you? When I when I went to college, I knew that the Navigators University and Kim's Crusade on that campus, and so I visited all three of the groups at their their weekly rally or gathering or whatever you call it. And the Navigators serious messages. Were, there was an application. There was something you could apply to life. So I I liked that. I I wanted to be serious about, and that was understood being serious about my faith was that I want to apply scriptures to life. And the navigators were the ones whose weekly meeting gave me more food for that than, yeah. than the others did. Yeah, so, so I stuck with the navigators. it sounds like that was a time when you kind of deepened, you were hungry for scripture and kind of learning to some of those sort of, sometimes we think of them as meteor truths, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Does anything, does any one idea stand out from that time? Well, uh, one of the, uh, during one of the years, actually the book of Philippians mm. was a, a, a theme at, at a number of points. I think it was my senior year that we, we actually studied the book of Philippians. But before that, I, I went to a summer program, and, and Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 to 11 always stood out to me. I uh, should be able to quote it, but I probably can't anymore. <laughs> uh, um, you know, for whatever was to my prophet, I now consider loss uh, for the sake of Christ. And I knew that I couldn't say that honestly. And I couldn't say that um, I consider everything rubbish compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And so that, that bothered me because obviously that's what I should be able to say and why can't I? And, mm. and so I... I did that a lot and and prayed a lot about that and I, I mean you you even I even have to wonder how much did Paul hundred percent right live that every day uh, forgive the sacrilege but uh, <laughs> I can resonate with that statement in a way that I couldn't when I was yeah. in college and and first really grappling with it. Um, I think there's something to, I, I don't know if you ever did this, but when I was a kid, you know, or young adult, there were so many experiences I wanted to have, right. That, that, uh, is, you know, I remember being afraid for it. For me, it showed up like this because we talked about the rapture a lot and Jesus coming back and, you know, like, well, don't, you know, I want him to come back, but not, not until, you know, I'd like to have some, some experiences, right? I'd like to get married. I'd like to have kids, things like that. And um, yeah. 
you know, and so I think there's a way, I think those are also all normal and good and God totally understands them and wants us to do that. But, uh, but there are, there are ways that that kind of, uh, you know, can feel when you're young, like, Hey, I don't want to, yeah, no, wait, I want these other things. Is that, is that what it was like for you? I, I can resonate with that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's part of it. And I'm, I've part of what I've learned is uh, understanding the journey makes that okay. Right. Like there's, there's more, there's more to learn as you go and it's all right to learn it. I mean, another thing that's been helpful for me is seeing Christ at the center as opposed to, Mm. as opposed to a a hierarchy that this has to be first and this is second and this is third and fourth and fifth. Instead, Christ is at the center. God, God made us to enjoy the relationships, you know, one of them being that of a spouse. Yeah. Uh, and, and so there isn't to, to say that, you know, that's rubbish is, is in one sense to sort of spit on God's gift. Right. Uh, and yet, by the same token, compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ, yes, right, even that wonderful relationship is. Uh, and 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 again, when Christ is at the center of it, that that changes everything. Yeah, absolutely. And then uh, actually, I found the centered metaphor more more helpful for me than than priorities, which is where doubt. Right. Right. Yeah, I love that. That's very good. Okay, so you were wrestling with this in college. I think that's a pretty, a pretty normal thing to wrestle with in college. Sounds sounds like. Uh, mm-hmm. Did you eventually go into missions yourself? I I did go overseas. Um, first of all, I was in the U.S. Navy. That was a real challenging experience. Oh, that's so. interesting. <laughs> yeah, that'll shape you. Yeah, that'll shape your body for sure. The, the last years on the ship, I, I sort of. The only way out, the best way out is through. Just keep going. Yeah. <laughs> Get to the end of the time. Um, How long were you in the Navy? Almost five years. Okay. Yeah. I, I, my, my sophomore year in college, second year, I, I was recruited. And uh, when it came time to decide, am I going for the interview or not, I still didn't really know. And I thought, well, if I don't do this, I'll think I've chickened out. And so I called the recruiter and said, okay, I'm coming. Interesting. And I thought, well, God doesn't want me to. I won't get selected. <laughs> In that particular case, the chances of my not being selected were very small. Uh. I would have had to have been, there would have to have been a serious problem for me not to have been selected for this program. So that kind of a fleece doesn't really work. The fleece only works if it isn't supposed to happen. Right. <laughs> if it's not the normal course of events. So... Uh, and that's the last decision that I made by not wanting to chicken out. But um, <laughs> that's interesting. Anyway, how, how did the Navy shape you? How, how did that like? Because I, I don't feel like it did. Oh, interesting. I mean that that's probably not true, but I don't feel like it did because I I don't feel like I changed. I feel like I wrote it out mm. rather than that I changed. And I actually didn't feel that much pressure to change. Uh, people on my ship, they knew who I was. Um, and my friends during my training, I had two, two and a half years of training, and uh, they also they, they knew who I was and they respected that. Okay, so when you got out, then what did you do? When I got out, I went and visited my parents to think of my going and uh, spent a month in Nepal, a few weeks in India, and a few weeks in the former Soviet Union, and uh, that's where I ended up. I uh, taught English for a number of years, and then I ended up in the leadership of the organization that I went there with. And I I stayed in the former Soviet Union for uh, a period of 19 years. Wow. That's, I suppose, the, the, the largest chunk of my life. Wow. Okay. Well, tell us about that. I know there's some things that maybe you don't want to Tell us yeah. in too much detail, but tell tell us 
like what was what was that like because that's that's definitely going to be a different kind of experience well that was another i mean i, I had another place that that reminded me of nepal actually mm. uh, again because of really friendly people and just really wonderful people there uh but as an expatriate Christian in a place where when we first went in, we assumed that the government didn't like Christians because this is the former Soviet Union. And, and so we weren't blasting that everywhere that, that we were Christians. But over the years, as I interacted with other expatriate Christians, there, this always came up as sort of, am I a missionary or am I not a missionary? And for most of the expatriate Christians there, people in their home church would consider them a missionary, but that wasn't a word that used there in the form of Soviet Union because there were two things that it came to people. One was you work for the CIA and you're trying to split up our country religiously, give the U.S. an excuse to come in and, and then bring back peace. That, that was the thing that I've been told to my face. The word missionary of the Union carries connotations. For those who have become evangelical Christians, it's a positive connotation, like it is for most evangelical Christians in the United States. But for others, it has some very negative connotations. One of them is that you work for the CIA, and the, C and the CIA is trying to country by creating religious division. This is especially true in the, the Muslim parts of the former Soviet Union, but would probably also be true in other parts. One of the, the churches that I went to, I had, I had somebody uh, who I'd known for two years, and then I, I was asked to give my test. And the person introduced me and said, I thought Tom was a spy too when, when he first <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> uh, but that, that's basically how anybody in the former Soviet Union, anybody from outside, at that in the early days after independence, and maybe they still do, I don't know. Yeah. The Soviet Union had trained people to, to think that a foreigner is a spy, period. Basically, for an expatriate Christian living in a place like the former Soviet Union, and, and there are more and more, increasingly, more and more countries in the world that do not that restrict missionaries in other or completely prohibit missionaries. And and so expatriate Christians have tended to, you know, the missionary organizations back in the 80s said, well, that's not a problem. We don't need to be missionaries. We can go and do other stuff. Right. Where tent maker gets floated a lot. Uh, but the, the challenge is that, and, and again, I mentioned missionaries uh, in, in the form of Soviet Union are thought of as being maybe uh, employees of the CIA trying to create religious division or maybe people who are paying others to, to change their religion, which neither of those is true. Uh, and so they're not helpful. So the word missionary. Um, but even though the missionizations changed tactics in the 80s, the concept of a missionary from sending churches didn't change. And so people who were going as tent to various places were still called missionaries in their home. Even if the home church was really well disciplined, never put anything on the end. Because uh, most people maybe have heard a story of someone who, who couldn't go someplace or got kicked out of because of something that was on their church's website. Uh, about that person, right? even if that called not a problem and then very carefully curated, still the way that a person like that is thought and with all that goes along with that. And uh, there's an interesting book called Transcending Mission, which challenges the whole Con our whole concept of missionary, but yeah, that's another story for another time. Okay. Uh, um, so there's it creates this 
hidden identity, whether you like it or not, whether you call yourself a missionary or not, there's there's a hidden identity that of missionary that comes from your background as an evangelical Christian, maybe from your home church, um, the way that people see you, and and then that there could also be the organization with. Uh, does it have a a mission statement that you could freely share with the in in the country where you? I'm not aware of any evangelical sending organization that does have a mission statement that would not be a problem and that their <laughs> promotional materials on the internet would not be a problem wow. if they came out in the country of service. Yeah. But we live in a world that this, this is something that uh, a former director of a mission organization, Rick Love, uh, has talked about when he was in that role, is that we live in a world where you can't keep an identity hidden because it doesn't work anymore. Right. You might get lucky, but you probably can't. And, and that creates a tension for someone trying to live as an authentic follower of Christ in a restrictive country. Um, if if you're, you belong to an organization whose mission, organization, mission statement you can't share, if you wouldn't be comfortable with your friends and your colleagues knowing where your finances come from, um, and uh, people, expatriate Christians all over the world who are in that situation, they they cope with that situation, uh, and in in many in some societies in the world, the less is said than in others, and more is understood without saying it. So for, for someone from the U.S. Or, or from maybe Western Europe, Northern Europe, uh, where in the society more is said and less is left unsaid, it's more of a challenge to have it. But if you come from a society that has more than left unsaid, it's not such a big deal, but it still is an issue. And Yeah. Um, I've heard of at least one child of such a family who walked away from the faith because they noticed that what my parents say when we're in a church in the U.S. about themselves is very different from what they say about themselves when we live in XYZ country. In my book, I call it Alm. You call it what? I created a country just to avoid saying XYZ country. Oh, gotcha. A restrictive country. I created a country called Almoria. Oh, nice. Um, so parents said in Almoria and what they said when they were at their. Uh, right. Which totally makes sense. Okay. So how did you wrestle with that? Because you, you obviously would have gone through that in, in those times you kind of started to describe some of it. What was uh, it difficult yeah. for you? Was it difficult? Did it change your formation it, in following Christ? It, it was sort of always an issue in the background of who am I? And, uh, I began to, oh, somebody needs to, to work on this and, and write a book about this. And, and so I began, I began by just going through the Bible and saying, well, what does this part of the Bible have to say about this issue? Uh, theologians probably wouldn't find that a very uh, rigorous methodology. But I wanted to just see it was a whole. Is there more that says, you know, because of the goal of sharing Christ with people who might not otherwise have the opportunity to hear about Christ, is it worth having hidden, is it worth doing something that, that I might not be really comfortable with? Or is there more that says being able to, to feel like you're, you're walking in integrity, complete integrity, is, is more important than the goal. And I concluded, after reading through the whole Bible with that question, that although you can find passages that will lead you in one direction, uh, the old message that I was getting was about being a person. And, and that 
also, I, I, I studied at, at Fuller 20 years ago, and one of the most formative courses was the course, and the professor, Glenn Stassen, is on me. And one of the things that I learned from, from him uh, was that the means are part of the ends, that the road that we're on is part of the destination. Yeah. And can't separate the two. And so if you say, well, I have this really important goal, and therefore I'm going to do this stuff that I might not otherwise do, that stuff that you're otherwise doing ends up being part of your end product. And, and so if it's a problem, right. there were there are say, well, there's no problem about not saying everything about you. I mean, nobody wants to know everything about you anyway. And, you know, we're, we've already been talking for a while here in this conversation. You know, I don't have time to tell you everything about myself. Right. Uh, but, again, there need to be something hidden. And if there needs to be something hidden, why I are a problem? And that that's going to come out in results that you get. And it's going to affect the results negatively. And... As in terms of being an expatriate Christian in uh, in a restrictive country, it's necessary to have a hidden identity. I think what we what we can do is reflect, and it takes time. It takes work. Whatever we've grown up with, assume about what it is to be a follower of Christ as a, in a place that's restrictive or in, in another country, but. But if we reflect on what is our, our goal, it is possible to, to come up with a, a life mission that one can share with anyone. Mm. And one will share it differently with different people just because when you're talking to someone, you, you, you gear your conversation to that person if you're any kind of you have any skill in communicating. But still, it should be recognizable. And again, this comes from Rick Love. That when you're talking to a secular person in your home country in the West, or in your home church in the West, or a person in your restrictive country that you work in, I'm more, if those three people suddenly meet each other and are talking about you, they should recognize that they're talking about the same person and not yeah. be, oh, that's who that guy is. <laughs> uh, you know? It should be recognizable that it's all one person. Yeah. And actually, in today's internet age, it has to be because it's very difficult, shall we say, to hide oh, yeah. yourself from another constituency. Yeah, people can find you, right? They they can figure out who you are, and it's it's pretty clear, you know, if you're if you're sharing authentically. Um, so I think that's interesting. So the book is called Authentic Lives. And you can get it at missionbooks.org. That is William Carey Publishing. Um, get that as well, or wherever you get great books. Um, you can find it there also. So, uh, Tom, I appreciate you just sharing a little bit of your story. I really love this idea of um, thinking a little bit more holistically about how do we think about um, you know where we go and how we share Christ. Um, in, in our whole lives. Uh, I think, I just think there's something there that we need to, that we really need to hear right now. So, um, we're kind of at the, at the end of our time. What, is there anything else you want to share with us or what do you want to leave us with? I'm convinced that following Jesus is not something that needs to be a secret, but that the way that we talk about it and the way that we conceive of it can get in the way and and make it something that that becomes secret. Uh, and yes, there are places maybe where even following Jesus in itself is 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 is, is, a, is the life threatening. But actually, I think those are fewer rather than more. Mm. Uh, sometimes we hear those stories and and it gets projected as if this is sort of everywhere and everywhere in the Muslim world, for example. Yeah. It, it, it's not true. Uh, and, and yet the, if, if we think about our following Christ as, as a dominating thing, which is the history of Western colonialism, 
Right. It's a, a serious baggage. And the book that I mentioned, Transcending Mission, it argues that the word missionary was not used until the Western colonial period began. And it, it, it would, began to be used by Jesuits in Spain in, I think, 1541. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, and that what we've called missionaries before that did not see themselves in that way. And that we've read that back into scripture and back into history. And that's a very powerful book. Uh, now that is an interesting that, idea. <laughs> that I read after writing mine. It would have affected my book if I, if I had read it before writing it. But, uh, but f- so, so the, the fact of Western colonialism and the domination that it has had over the world and, and continues to have even without sure. the formal structure creates a lot of problems around following Jesus if we express it in a way that, that brings that baggage with it. Yeah. Uh, whereas if we can distance ourselves from that baggage uh, and, and focus on the person of Jesus, that that shouldn't be something that needs to be a secret or a hidden identity. Yeah. Well, that's really interesting. I think there's a lot to be said from the New Testament about living a quiet life, sharing life and your faith with those around you immediately, and uh, and just letting that be, uh, you know who who you are. Very interesting. I mean, you can you can also take your your. There's a book called Scatter, which suggests that one should get a job overseas because there are, there are millions of jobs available out there, and you can you can live. Not just where you happen to be. You can deliberately go someplace yeah. uh, and still do what you were just saying um, and live a quiet life and, and shine among those that you're around. Very interesting. Well, I love that. That's a great encouragement, Tom. I appreciate you sharing a little bit of your story, some of your work, and uh, being with us today. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Eric.